Now we've briefly touched the topic of object consistency. Let's really cement the idea before we go forward with some real world examples. So first we have this assignment. We need to upload and parse a CSV. Perhaps we downloaded it from our bank website and then we're gonna loop over each record and store those transaction details in a database. This is how our CSV reader works. We instantiate it and then when we read a file name, we get data returned that is an array of records. We can loop through that array and get access to each record. So let's go ahead and start writing our class. We're gonna call it Bank Transaction Importer, and it's going to take an instance of the CSV reader. So now we have a reference to the reader and we can use it in the future. Now we have a public method called import, which is going to allow us to feed a file name in. It's going to use a CSV reader to create an array of records that will then be able to loop over so that we can store these records in the database. So when we actually implement this, it looks a little bit something like this. But now we have a bug. So right here in the import method, we're trying to call read on the CSV reader. But at no point in time do we set the CSV reader. So in order to fix it, we need to do something like this. Now we have the CSV reader set, and when we import the statement, it'll all work properly. The problem is we wrote this object in a way that's going to allow it to fail. It's going to be harder for the developers who use it to diagnose and fix than an object that was designed in a way that it could not fail. It's exceptionally important for us, especially when we're doing things like event sourcing, to not allow our objects to be in an inconsistent state. If we were to create an instance of an object and it's not actually valid, then we were to persist it off or store off the events that it throws or something like that, then we end up with a world of hurt. And the best idea, the best thing that we can do to solve this is to just simply design our objects around the business's model, around the business's way of thinking about the objects. So let's look at a way where we can take this object and fix it. So when we call import and we add the file name, if we haven't set the CSV reader, it's going to fail. So one thing that we could do is we could actually pass that CSV reader into the import statement. Now this might be a particularly good way of doing it if, for example, the CSV reader object itself held state about the file name. So maybe in this example, the CSV reader accepts the file name as a parameter in its constructor, and then we just inject the reader into the importer. That would be perfectly reasonable. Now, since it doesn't work that way, in this approach, it might be better to do something like this. We're passing the CSV reader into the bank transaction importer's constructor. Now, we know that the bank transaction importer is going to be consistent from the moment it's created, and then when we call import, we just have to pass it a file name. In order to change this bank transaction importer class, we're going to focus on the setCSV reader method, and then we're going to change it to a constructor. So now, when this object is created, a valid instance of the CSV reader must be passed into it. And then every time we call import in the future, we will be calling read on a valid instance of that class. Let's use another example. And in this case, I wanna focus on the interactions with the business so that we can understand the way the business rules define our consistency. So in this case, we have an invoice. Our company generates invoices that we can then send to our customers. Now an invoice needs to have a company name and a tax ID, so we can just set those here. We know that the company name and the tax ID are both important to the business, but we don't know if it's absolutely required that the company and tax ID are defined at all times. Because in this situation, at the end of these two lines, we have an invoice that does not have all of this information. So what we can do is we can go to our boss and say, now in our system, in the way that our business thinks, is it necessary to have the company name and the tax ID in order to have a valid invoice? And our boss says, well, I see how in some situations you may want to build up the invoice inside the system. And in those situations, you would have different concepts like an incomplete invoice and a completed invoice. And in those situations, it may be okay to set the company and tax ID later. But that's not what we're doing. In our situation, no, every invoice is, we're going to have the information already, and it's not okay for our system to have an invoice in it that somebody on our team interacts with that does not have this information. 
So, okay, now I see that we created this invoice in a way that is a mistranslation from what our business thinks about invoices. In order to solve that, in order to translate these business ideas correctly into the programming language, we can use the constructor. So we're passing in the business name and the tax ID into the constructor, and now we have the chance to, every single time we create a new instance of invoice, have one that's valid from the beginning. This keeps us from accidentally persisting something that is invalid that might then be state that is utilized for some other process that results in an incorrect state, which is then used for some other process and snowballs through the rest of your state. And while event sourcing, we're going to explore some different ways of dealing with this. But first, we're going to need to have a solid grasp on how the business rules translate into implementation. Now, I'm noticing a problem here. This tax ID is probably not valid. I just entered blah, blah, blah here. And now I need to go to my boss and say, hey, I am now just accepting any sequence of characters. It could be a blank string. It could be garbage. This is what I'm accepting for a tax ID. Now, is this valid? And my boss comes back to me and says, no, the tax IDs must be from the Netherlands. And the specific format that they have to have is this. So then I write down that format or I go and find a regular expression that expresses that format. Now I have to think, how am I going to implement this so that this ID is always going to be valid? Well, now I can look in the invoice class. You can see that we have the recipient and the recipient tax ID. Now I need to take that logic, that regular expression probably, of what a valid format for the tax ID is, and now I can create a method called isValid. This method is going to return true or false based on whether or not the tax ID conforms to the regular expression. Now, if we come back to the place where we instantiated the invoice, we have the company name and the tax ID, and now we can actually have an if statement that says, if this invoice is valid, do something, otherwise do something else. But now we have another problem. It's actually the same problem. And the problem is we create an object here that is potentially immediately inconsistent. We don't know. And even if it's consistent, we won't have any idea until we're inside the if statement. If it's not consistent, then not only is it not consistent immediately, it's also not consistent here, and it's not consistent everywhere else in the rest of the code that has an object reference to that invoice. This creates opportunities for us to forget some kind of validation check, to forget some kind of states, to forget some kind of state update that will then allow us to persist invalid data into the rest of our system. So how can we fix that? We can take this and change it from a public method to a private method, and then we can directly call this validation method inside the constructor. So here we can say, if this is not valid, then throw an exception. Now, what happens when an exception is thrown in a scope of code? When an exception is thrown, the execution pointer is ejected out of the current scope of code. So in this case, we verify that the tax ID is not valid, we throw an exception, and this constructor never completes. That means that when we intended to call a new instance of invoice, we never actually get one. In this way, an invoice object can never be created that has an invalid tax ID, according to the rules of our business. So now we have kind of a different problem. And the problem that we're facing is we have this validation logic for the tax ID inside the invoice class, which means that everywhere else in our application that references a tax ID is going to need duplicated logic. If our boss comes back and says that we not only send invoices in the Netherlands, but also Belgium, then now we have to go through 16 places and update that validation code. The chance for human error here is, is immense. So what can we do to centralize this logic somewhere that allows us to use valid tax IDs in all of our objects to ensure consistency in these objects without having to be redundant and spread this logic all over our application? Well, instead of passing in a string, which is a specific type of data, which is simply a sequence of characters, we can pass in a new type of data that's called a tax ID. Now, a string is valid if it's empty. A string is valid if it's full of garbage. A tax ID is not. So we inject the string into the tax ID object. Now, this tax ID object exists as an abstract representation of a tax ID. And having these types 
like Tax ID, in your application allows them to become like magnets that attract all of the behavior for this kind of data into this one centralized place. And then we can use this tax ID across the rest of the entire application, everywhere that we need to reference a tax ID, and never have to have redundant knowledge. All the knowledge is in one place that makes sense. So if we then add the validation logic to this class, we can in the constructor say, if not, this is valid, then we can throw a very specific type of exception that is very helpful for us to track down problems, that shows the number that failed, and we can centralize this information right in this object. And this object now becomes a reusable representation of tax ID. Now this is beautiful. The way that we can validate that this invoice has a valid tax ID is to look at the way it's injected into the constructor and simply make sure that we're receiving an instance of the tax ID object. This abstract representation of a tax ID will ensure that it is valid on its own. You won't be able to create a new instance of a tax ID unless it passes that test. That means if we have the object instance of that class, it is fine to be passed in this constructor. And because we type hinted it here, we know it is valid according to our business's rules. Now our invoice is free to hold only the information relative to being an invoice. In this case, the invoice simply communicates that it needs a recipient name and a tax ID. This object still isn't entirely consistent because we can see how things can go wrong further from here. So in this case, we do have a company name and we do have a tax ID, but we go to our boss and we say, what happens if the company name is blank? So what's the difference between null and an empty string to us if they're both mean that the invoice's name is blank? And of course our boss says, I'm sorry, um, we can't have empty strings. We can't just have blank company names in our invoices. We need actual names. But what we're not able to do is validate against some system in an automatic way that the company name is correct. So we're just going to accept anything that is not empty at this point. And then if there's some problem with the company name, it'll be brought up to a human in our company and we're going to have a human process for resolving that. Okay, so now we have the business rule that we cannot have an empty company name. As we already did with the tax ID type, we can easily encode this rule and any others that come up later into a new type called company name. So now we have multiple types, all of which pull in the behavior and the validation, the business logic and the business rules for that type. So we don't have to spread them around the rest of our application. We can take this further and further. And we can ensure that at no point in time can we create objects that do not pass the requirements from our business. This is the nature of creating consistent models. And this is really important because when we're creating domain models, we want to make sure that all of the ideas expressed in the code match up with the business's ideas as much as possible. It'll prevent us from storing stuff in the database that could then have a snowballing effect on the validity of the rest of our data.